um, very pleased to have you with us here today for the Climate Week edition of This is CDR. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals under development for New York and other states and jurisdictions. Um, some of you have done so already, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, I'm Toby Bryce, based in Brooklyn, New York, and I uh, work on CDR policy advocacy with Open Air. So just some quick background on open air. We're a uh, all volunteer open source global advocacy network um, dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Our growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the areas of research and development, policy advocacy, and activist market development. Please join us. Um, there'll be some links to follow us on Twitter and to join our group via our website in the chat. Um, just a quick word on CDR. Most of you, are, if you're here, are familiar with what the, it means, but CDR is the practice of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it safely and durably in the geosphere, the ocean, or in long-lived products. Um, when we consider CDR as we are today and with the series, first and foremost, it's essential to emphasize that CDR is not in any way an alternative to reducing emissions. Um, we must reduce global emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and completely as possible, full stop. That said, every credible climate forecast, including in very stark terms, the most recent IPCC assessment report indicate that CDR will be required at gigaton scale, that's billions of tons per year by mid-century um, to counteract the emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate and ultimately to start removing the tremendous excess of anthropogenic CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. If you're new to CDR, um, the, the image in the bottom right here, the CDR primer um, is a great resource and a great place to start. Um, we've also had, I guess, six or seven of these This Is CDR sessions that you can see on our YouTube channel. Um, and so uh, these are some great resources if you want to dig in further. And of course, we're here today to learn more. And we'll be, um, we'll be continuing these sessions weekly on an ongoing basis through the fall. Now, please meet my uh, colleague, Mega, who uh, will introduce today's presenter. Hi everyone, I'm Mega Raghavan, uh, based in London. I also work on Open Air's CDR policy advocacy team uh, with a particular interest in the legislative policy opportunities for California, where I'm from. Um, this week, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Dave Gold David Goldberg from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observ Observatory. Dr. Goldberg will provide an overview of geologic sequestration of carbon dioxide and the terrestrial and offshore sequestration opportunities in New York, with a focus on the co-location opportunity with offshore wind. A um, couple of housekeeping notes. So our format is going to be a 15 to 20 minute presentation, followed by a few prepared questions, and then we'll have moderated audience Q&A. Uh, so please type any questions you have for Dave into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, it's separate from the chat box, so make sure you find the correct uh, Q&A section. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send that video link out to everyone who registered. We'll also post it on Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also be live tweeting today's event. Um, I think our Twitter link should already be in the chat and please follow along um, with that. If you tweet, the event hashtag is hashtag this is CDR. Um, and now for the main event. So Dr. David Goldberg is a Lamont Research Professor at Columbia University um, and his re research interests focus on the integration of different technologies and cross-disciplinary approaches to, achieve, to develop achievable climate solutions. Dr. Goldberg received his undergraduate and MS degrees in Earth and Planetary Sciences from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology um, and his doctorate in geophysics and an MBA from Columbia University. He conducted postdoctoral studies in the Institut Francais du Petrole in Paris and has been at Le Mont Doherty since 1985. He also currently serves as a core faculty member for the Lenta Center for Sustainable Energy at Columbia and deputy director of the Le Mont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Uh, Dave, over to you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mega. Thank you, Toby. I appreciate being here. It's a great opportunity to talk about this, this problem and this, some ideas to address it. Um, I'm happy to uh, give you a presentation of um, some of the work we have started. So, yeah, so I, I, as noted, so I'm a, a Lamont Research Professor at Columbia University. Um, and today, I'd like to give you uh, some, over, some general overview background about um, uh, storage of CO2, particularly in um, offshore environments, 
the geological storage of CO2, um, and the opportunities, as was mentioned, in combining those technologies um, and that solution for storage of CO2 with enough energy to do uh, direct air capture. Um, and this is a <clears throat> obviously a critical technology, as Toby mentioned, and this puts a, a, a finer point on that, what he said, was that we are looking at beyond, um, not ignoring, but looking beyond just the, um, the capture and, and storage of, of positive emissions um, that are essentially illustrated in this, in this diagram by uh, the green line, um, but to by end of the century, increase our, our capture and storage capacity uh, to gigatons, billions of tons of CO2 removal beyond um, what is just captured and stored so that we can meet our targets such as in the Paris, uh, the Paris agreements. Um, the recent IPCC report shows that this is even more critical um, and that we are still heading upwards. So the green line and the orange lines are still going up um, and are projected to do so. So the capability of pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing it away is even more important um, these days. We'll be looking at, I'll be looking at uh, methodologies on how we can do that. Um, first, I'll talk about negative emissions and carbon mineralization as one of the storage opportunities for uh, once CO2 is captured, drawn out of the atmosphere or from point sources. Talk about direct air capture technology um, offshore storage, and in particular, the wind uh, potential uh, and the opportunity for combining that with CO2 uh, capture and storage. And just leave you with a few completing, uh, concluding remarks. So at simplest form, we're looking to move us towards a, a flat line in terms of emissions, net zero. Um, that includes basically sources that we all know are point sources, concentrated sources of CO2 that need to capture um, from various, various emissions, uh, if possible and where possible from things like powered steel plants, uh, refineries. And this is by far the largest amount of um, uh, capacity that we can capture CO2 quickly. And it would be removing CO2 from being, emission, from being emitted basically before it's emitted. Um, pre-emission. Looking at direct air capture or other techniques to extract CO2 from the air after it's been emitted, this is post-emission, um, and this is what's been often referred to as negative emission. And all of that CO2 needs to be safely and, and permanently stored um, or used in, in, in products or both. Uh, so we're looking particularly at geological storage here, um, looking also even more specifically at least one option in um, the mineral storage, that is mineralization of the CO2 in certain rocks, uh, basalt rocks, or these are lavas typically that have been cooled and then placed around the globe. Um, and together, these are a solution that is that offers uh, both sources, both the extraction negative emission source, extracted CO2 from the air, as well as concentrated source um, emissions to be stored. So Looking a little bit more closely at the, for the purpose of this talk at the negative emission technologies, this, um, this schematic shows that there are a variety of tools at our, at our uh, fingertips to look at um, negative emission technologies using mineralization. Um, this is really an enhancement of what the natural processes that occur on the surface of the earth already. Uh, enhanced weathering, this is the conversion of CO2 from, atmosphere, uh, from the atmosphere into, rock, into rocks with carbonates. Um, and other minerals. Those are stored permanently in long-term reservoirs on, on the earth. In fact, the largest long-term reservoirs of carbon on the earth are carbonates, uh, both sub-ocean and um, in, on, on the continents. Um, but there are also the engineered approaches where we can enhance these activities, looking to mineralize mine tailings, industrial waste, steel slags. Uh, we can look at, uh, at calcining looping mechanisms, where we inject heat and do basically create a, a lime process, uh, an ancient technology essentially that can be potentially scaled up uh, to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and then there's the mechanical approaches that we'll be talking about a bit more today, uh, direct air capture, um, as well as not, let's not forget the point sources options, which we'll not be discussing in great detail, but I like keeping them on the, uh, on the radar. 
the idea here is to take, once those sources of CO2 are captured and concentrated, that they're injected into these formations onshore or offshore, in particular, the ones that mineralize like basalt rock, basalt lavas or peridotite rocks, which are ultramafic, even, even um, higher concentrations of uh, mineralizing cations, and, um, but not exclusively. So I don't wanna be, this is the only, say that this is the only solution for either onshore or offshore storage. Uh, there's a lot of potential there and we'll look at that at the, toward the end here. Um, so the concept here is not particularly new. Air capture in general, as you, many of you are aware, is a relatively old technology used in, tech, in, in scrubbing CO2 from confined spaces like submarines and aircraft. And it is not unlike the, uh, the ability of a catalytic converter in your car to scrub with a filter uh, the, the emissions and capture, um, uh, in this case, CO2. So in this conception from over a decade ago, capture, distributed capture, both on land and localized storage in reservoirs uh, near those capture points, um, both onshore and offshore in different kinds of formations, allow us in, at that point in theory to spread out the capture capacity. Um, we can capture CO2 from the air anywhere because uh, CO2 mixes in the atmosphere quickly. Um, and if there's a localized storage location, we can move forward with without much transport essentially and taking that concentrated CO2 and storing it uh, on, on site or below site. So looking at that concept, um, how can you upscale it? Well, we don't, we can only talk about upscaling right now, but after we've done it in, in, uh, in, a, um, in, the in the real world. And fortunately there's been a fantastic um, roughly decade long experiment in Iceland called the CarbFix project uh, that uses a combined approach looking at captured CO2 from a power plant, in this case, a geothermal power plant, uh, to inject that CO2 with local groundwater in the lavas, these basalt rocks uh, below that site on land, uh, where it turns into mineral form carbonate minerals below the, below the surface. That is a, um, one of the two sites, one of the two locations where this experiment, this mineralization, injection of mineralization has happened in real, in, in real rocks in a pilot, in pilot stage. And they are now upscaling to upwards of 10,000 tons of CO2 in, injected annually um, at this location in the second phase of the project. What's happened and very interestingly has happened is they uh, collaborated with a company called Climeworks. I'm sure many of you have been aware of them. Um, out of Swiss, Switzerland um, to piggyback a direct air capture unit scrubbing CO2 from the atmosphere next to the power plant and co-injecting it with the CO2 from that geothermal plant in the same location. So this demonstrates basically co-injection um, and they have demonstrated of course previously the successful carbonation and storage of the CO2 in that site. So the conception that is illustrated here is that is uh, tries to move the um, activity to the near shore environment and then potentially to the deep uh, far, far shore deep ocean environment for two primary reasons. One is that there is a lot of resource there, um, storage resource in terms of basalt rock or other rocks. Uh, there's an incredible amount of water resource, seawater in this case, uh, where in the on land site they were injecting with groundwater. Um, and there's a large energy resource. And that's the piece I want to talk about a bit more. Um, in the Iceland experiment on land, there was uh, residual power and energy from the geothermal plant that was used to conduct the uh, air capture activity. Offshore, uh, alternative sources of power and energy would be, would be required. So the important one, um, since we are, before we move uh, on, is, is to look at what we've looked at is wind, uh, particularly offshore wind. There's also been an upscaling of the pilot project in, in, uh, by Climeworks in the Iceland project. Uh, they have scaled it up and just opened a, uh, a ribbon cutting, I guess, in the last couple of weeks of the Orca plant, which scales up the air capture capacity to um, approaching 4,000 tons of CO2 a year. So a significant upscaling. Um, and it is tied in in the very same way to the injection and storage in Iceland that's been ongoing at the, at the um, CarbFix project. 
So these are exactly the kinds of demonstrations we are trying to key off of and, and think about how we might upscale. So one way we did that and started to do that is to look elsewhere and particularly in the areas around the Northeast, uh, North American continent. Um, two sites in particular have, were focused on in a uh, workshop conducted about a year, roughly about a year ago uh, by Columbia World Projects and looking to accelerate the carbon capture and storage with this combined concept of uh, direct air capture renewables, in this case, wind uh, resources to power that activity and storage in basalt formations. And the two locations are identified on those on the map by these little funny circles um, in the Cascadia margin in the Pacific Northwest and on the East Coast in the, um, in the yellow circle. And the workshop looked at the full scale of issues, not just the technologies, but the long-term energy needs, the potential for monitoring, uh, obviously distinctions in, uh, in geologic terrain, uh, legal and regulatory framework, and also the public perception and locations are obviously different. There are similarities though, um, and that they both potentially target basalt. Um, the, the water depths are considerably different and the amount we know about the infrastructure and about the geological formations in both locations are different. So it's a, com it's a comparison um, I'm going to talk mostly today or in the remaining few minutes about the East Coast um, target for a couple of reasons I'll bring, bring to light. Uh, one of which is that we are a, um, in, in, in the Northeast uh, corridor offshore in an area that is quite old geologically um, <clears throat> and are uh, have identified um, basalt formations in, 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 the, in various locations in New Jersey, in Connecticut, um, even in Nantucket, near shore, but on land. Um, these are very analogous to large flows of basalt that, are, that were tested in the Washington State Injection Project, where you can see on the right a sample where CO2 was injected um, in liquid form and mineralized into carbonates, filling pore spaces in the, in the rock sample on the right. Similar formations exist on the left where flows of lava basically supersede one another and form open pore space that would be targets for this kinds of injection um, elsewhere. So these basalt flow tops, um, at least in the, in, in the on-land situation is uh, our target reservoirs. On the East Coast, in addition, we have uh, this development, which is very active these days, looking at um, BOEM has issued a land le uh, sorry, offshore leases for wind farm development. Uh, recently, they're identified here in the, you can see between base, the New Jersey margin and Nantucket. Um, and it, expansions of these sites with corresponding onshore connections and port facilities will all hopefully build out to produce a significant amount of renewable power to feed the grid along the Northeast Corridor. This is by far the most important aspect of um, deploying wind, offshore wind leases in this area to replace fossil energy, fossil electrons in the grid with renewable energy in the grid. However, as many of you know, probably that uh, wind is, has one thing that's, that's different than fossil energy and that is that it is intermittent. Um, and that wind energy moves in um, uh, offshore, onshore directions at different times of day, different seasons. Uh, the grid has demands that are uh, variable over the day and over the week and over the month and over the seasons. So there are often times when wind energy in particular is curtailed or bypassed. Um, that sometimes is referred to as even negative pricing. So you could see wind energy that has less than uh, zero dollar value. So looking at that, looking at the major installation of potential wind resource on the East Coast and looking at the potential storage resource in precisely the same area or very nearly the same area, which I can show you in the, this slide, um, there are geological resources that essentially overlay with the close to the offshore wind development areas. Um, the stars on the left-hand side show some of those locations where the rocks I showed previously, the cores I showed um, are, have been identified on land like Nantucket in New Jersey and in Hartford. Um, the purple on the left-hand side indicate 
recent studies of where we think rift basins that are buried that have similar rocks uh, exist. So they're very closely aligned with the offshore wind developments. In addition to that, the uh, Department of U.S. Department of Energy project called the Mid-Atlantic Offshore Starbin Carbon Storage Research Assessment Project was conducted a few years back and looked at um, both those reservoirs as well as the sedimentary reservoirs, the sandstones in the near shore environment and, and identified large bullseyes, as you see here at various levels um, and various depths that have gigatons, hundreds of gigatons cap potential capacity for storage. So the storage in this vicinity is um, uh, probably not the constraining factor, although we haven't demonstrated storage in these locations yet. So the, the notion here is to put these pieces um, together. Um, and I think I'll just spend one more minute before opening it up for questions. And the idea is to piggyback our capture, capture and storage capacity using offshore wind infrastructure that is being deployed in this area um, already. And the idea would first start by networking that infrastructure for multiple purposes, not just production of wind, but also designing it for the capacity to add, to build out of air capture as well. That then allows for variable low cost energy, negative priced energy, if that would otherwise be curtailed from the wind to not be, um, to not be curtailed um, and to be used for a climate benefit rather than just um, uh, just dumped. So that's the, uh, the local storage or relatively local storage that could be identified on the East Coast offshore could be added to with um, uh, from point source, source, using point sources as well. So the greater capacity than just needed from the, from the air capture at those, at those wind plants, the wind farm plants. And we're creating essentially a wind carbon hub um, in the offshore environment for with after investment um, of the infrastructure basically operates with very low energy costs, not unlike what would potentially has potentially powered the activities in Iceland. So uh, designing these projects now with co-located solutions is, is would be the next step, thinking about doing these things together, not in silos. Um, and obviously to do that, industrial partnerships, um, both with the wind operators, the direct air capture operators and technology developers, um, and ultimately financing institutions would be critical, uh, crit all critical next steps. So it's a, it's, it's a thought, it's a direction to, to push direct air capture um, outward away from the shoreline and help us um, start to address the, the large need for um, CDR. In, uh, in the coming years. Um, I think that's my last slide. Yep, uh, I'm happy to hand it back to Toby or yep. Megan, awesome. whoever, whoever's hand in questions. I, yeah. I think I'm on, I left some time for questions, I hope. Fantastic, yeah, we have plenty of time and everyone please, um, we got some great questions in the Q&A, please um, keep asking those. We do have a few prepared questions to start with and then Mega is keeping track of the questions that are in the um, Zoom Q&A and, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, number one, I, I'm always curious about sort of your presenter's intellectual journey in terms of how you got to the research you're working on now. Um, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you started thinking about this when it first occurred to you that we could turn CO2 into stone, pump it underground, um, and then kind of how you got to your current um, interest in the offshore opportunity? We, we don't have enough time for that discussion, but <laughs> I'll Plenty. give it a shot. I'm sorry. That's a <laughs> no, bad joke. The, no, um, no it, it, I, can, I know exactly when it started, and, and there was on, it was, it's a little, a little uh, trite, but I was on a research expedition in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, um, drilling into basalt and studying the natural system in the Atlantic Ocean. And it was the same time as the uh, Kyoto uh, Conference in the last century. Um, and, and that site, what we were studying, actually naturally draws down uh, seawater at 1,000 liters a minute. It sucks water out of the ocean and it comes, travels laterally and essentially uh, alters the subsurface rocks, the salts. Um, and I, listening to the conference, studying that on, the, in, on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic, 
um, I just had a moment of, well, that those things could fit together in a very interesting way. Um, and then we started doing uh, work. We started doing research experiments. We did, we did trial experiments in the laboratory and in small field projects. Um, the Iceland part project that we were in, intimately involved in getting started at, uh, with uh, Columbia and the University of Iceland or, or in the early days, um, as well as a variety of other small scale injection projects and all referring to the idea of mineralization of storage on, in basalt. Uh, that then my, my interest um, broadened a bit when we were lucky enough to have uh, for a while uh, Klaus Lochner as a researcher at Columbia and we collaborated looking at air capture con uh, combinations and laboratory opportunities to study air capture materials and putting that, that was the origin or around that time was the origin of this idea of combining air capture with, uh, with, with mineralization storage, and in particular at remote places, um, away from people uh, where resources are plentiful. Well, all the, all resources. Got it. So if you go on and on and on. But, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's great. That's, it's always, I just care, like the, the initial sort of genesis of the idea is always, I think, really interesting to people. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, you know, you, you talked about the primary place in the world where this is happening terrestrially, the, the carb fix climb works project in Iceland, which is super exciting. And it's, you know, it's happening at kiloton scale right now. And they're promising megaton scale by um, the end of the decade. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the initiative here in North America, solid carbon that you're involved with? Uh, it seems like that's kind of where we're furthest along in terms of doing this uh, in the US. Um, they're offshore at least. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, so carb fix is is scaling up. As you note, um, we are uh, discussing and collaborating on moving that, uh, moving that offshore, at least to the nearshore environment. To think about the difference, the differences when you start looking at uh, seawater instead of groundwater, uh, for example, and the mineralization potential. And and a distinction about in in carb in carb fix is that mineralization is absolutely essential. Um, it's, it's relatively shallow. It has been, there's large volumes there, but it's required to be stored. Uh, CO2 needs to be done, uh, 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 sorry, dissolved and injected for rapid mineralization in order to store it safely. And it works. Um, when we move to deeper water or deeper environments in general, you can inject CO2 in um, liquid form, in pure CO2 form or supercritical form. And that allows much more volume, volume of injection for a given amount of energy of pumping the CO2 in. So if that is feasible, uh, there are advantages to doing that. There are also some disadvantages in that if um, it's, potential, it's potential for mineralization and it's not been demonstrated yet, might slow down um, if you don't have enough fluid mixing, uh, water mixing with the CO2 and how fast that those two fluids uh, dissolve. Um, that may not be critical if we have the time to let it dissolve and let it mineralize over time. And I believe in the oceans, in solid carbon especially, and probably on the East Coast, if that plays out in mineral in basalt reservoirs, those processes um, can take a bit of time because it's all well sealed above. Um, they're, they're deep, there are layers of, there are blankets of impermeable sediments that uh, flanket the seafloor. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of greater pressure. So the amount of CO2 that is the upward force of the CO2 is much smaller. And the um, idea of storage is in that sense, more of a conventional storage approach. And we can let mineralization um, permanently store the CO2 over time. The conventional storage is, is exactly that. It would inject deep with, with uh, uh, seals and trapping that keep the CO2 geologically stored. Got it. And on, on the solid carbon project, can you just recap what that is and where it is in terms of its development and right. located and all that? Yeah, so, sorry, I-, I okay. No, no, it's good. That was my- Distracted a little bit. Yeah, the, so, so the solid carbon is, is, a, is a location off the, um, off the Pacific Northwest. It's a collaborative project these days. It has been a collaborative project in its in its second iteration, um, it started as a uh, 
uh, Department of Energy feasibility study. It has migrated to the solid carbon project feasibility study phase two, um, looking at the potential of a specific offshore site in the, in the Cascadia Basin, where we have probably the most information um, of anywhere in the globe about the basalt rocks that are buried on the, uh, on the sea bottom. Um, that's because it's been drilled and studied and in fact tested uh, in, for scientific purposes for decades. So we really understand as well as, well as anywhere what that reservoir looks like. The, it, the um, um, experiments that have been done there are essentially exactly the same as the CO2 injection experiment, the, the pilot experiment at CarbFix done without CO2. So that experiment has already, is already in our pocket. Um, we want to repeat that experiment with CO2 involved to so watch and monitor and demonstrate that in fact CO2 will, will um, mineralize just as we expect. Um, it's also looking at the other elements, the, the, um, the, uh, the, energy piece, the energy piece, looking at offshore wind in that area, um, as well as collaborations on um, mechanisms and technologies for air capture and combining those three, those, those three pieces together very much as both the other projects, both the carb fix project and the East Coast project. In that way, the, carb, the solid carbon project all have the same objectives. Got it. Very cool. Um, in terms of the New York adjacent opportunity offshore, um, it's, I guess it's pretty, you know, you're, you've done some of the initial research. Can you walk through the major things that need to happen, the major milestones between where we are today and actually getting an op operation up and running? So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's good to mention that the car a solid carbon project in that context first or start there, that we do know a lot about the geology in, in solid carbon. Um, we know less about the geology in the Atlantic East, East Coast in, in this way, at least in the, the basalt geology. There have been, um, a number of wells drilled for in the 70s and 80s for industrial purposes on the East Coast, but very, very few, I don't, and maybe even none, have been drilled and touched into those, but what we believe are basalt um, deposits on the East Coast. So that's step one, uh, at least for the East Coast, to, to do pilot studies, sample those basalts, demonstrate that we have indeed um, um, predicted them and projected that they are the offshore extent of the same basalts we see, the same formations we see on the on land, on shore, um, and then conduct a pilot experiment without CO2, just demonstrating that those are injectable, viable resources uh, that could be used the, similar to um, the, this, again, similar to the offshore experiment in solid carbon without CO2. And then stepping, the next step would be to use CO2, very similar to the experiments done either in Iceland or in Washington state uh, with CO2 in different forms. So uh, we're going through the, uh, uh, the experimental process, but we're starting a little bit earlier in the uh, earlier, uh, more upstream in terms of demonstrating, characterizing the rock, making a demonstration. But those are all very well understood processes. We've done that everywhere uh, where we want to understand a reservoir. So we can move forward, we can establish that reservoir, and then we can add the, the, the engineered technologies um, over them with platforms that tie into the, the build out of the wind, the wind structures that are nearby. Got it. So, so, um, so just, it's a stepwise. It's yeah. A stepwise. So in terms of the R&D milestones, what is a, you know, assuming you get funding and, and, and all of that, you know, which is obviously not always is an open question can be, but what is the what is a reasonable time frame for running through the key R and D milestones? And then obviously there will be commercialization, financing, et cetera, milestones. Um, but a second question: Are there policy issues that need to be resolved before you could actually put put this process into op commercial operation? So, like, what is there are what is like a reasonable R and D time frame? And then are there policy questions that we need to resolve before we could actually deploy? So yes, yes, and yes, there are all those things need to be addressed. I, I do think, and I do believe that they are and can pr proceed in parallel, at least to some extent. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work 
that has been done um, already looking at offshore the offshore environment. This is an, this is out of this is in federal waters, uh, at least the East Coast area. Uh, so there are certainly a lot of um, discussion about expanding the, the geological atlas for storage um, offshore. Uh, Department of Energy and other groups have done that around the around the certainly the Gulf Coast and the East Coast margins on the U.S. side. There are policy issues with regard to regulation. Um, some of that is changing in our our current um, markup bills in terms of the ability to do offshore storage. Um, there are London Protocol issues, um, and that brings us back to solid carbon, which is at least the existing sites that we are testing are in Canadian waters. Um, so that's an advantage because those policies are, uh, um, the London Protocol policies are, are closer to being implemented there uh, than they are here, but they need to be integrated. I mean, we need a global policy that allows us to happen wherever it needs to happen. So that needs work, but there, that it is progressing um, in parallel. On the technological side, I think that the geological work that it sort of I outlined just previously can certainly proceed as quickly and as funding becomes available. Um, it, takes, it takes some time to, to mount and scale up a, um, a series of research expeditions to do sampling and testing and evaluation, but it's on the order of, uh, can be on the order of months to years, single digits, not decades by any means. And the scale up of the uh, engineered systems, certainly the wind, uh, the wind platforms is happening and the direct air captures, at least the existing handful of companies are working diligently to scale up their methodologies and they, they differ. Um, increasing efficiencies is of course of important in all of, the, uh, in, in all of them. Um, and I think we can be fairly agnostic in terms of which technologies are deployed yet uh, those can all those things can happen in parallel. So when it comes time to uh, integrate and put these pieces together, I think having the, the groundwork, the agreements, the intention in place among the, the interested parties is something we can also start right now and should. Because if you wait till all of those technologies are built out, it's too late. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and and the notional capacity of the offshore deposits. I mean, if, if if it checks out the way that that you think it might, in theory, there's very significant capacity in the New York region offshore, right? So storage capacity, yeah. So so that so the um, yeah that prior the Department of Energy study had had hundreds of gigatons of capacity in just in just small, relatively not small areas, but relatively um, con, uh, contained areas off the East Coast in sands. Um, we. We have estimated millions of tons capacity, but very, very much in, in the basalt layers that are analogous to the onshore basalts. Um, but that's that's by proxy. So those would be those would be more uh, need more potential um, would be more characterization to establish the potential for those. But they have a great advantage of being very closely located in shallow water, um, the, and these are this is less than 100 meters water depth. Uh, on the fringe, on the outer fringe of the of the continental shelf, very close to these platforms that are intend, intended to be along the wind the wind core. So the co-location of those, and, and even before co-location of the infrastructure, the co-location of the environmental and characterization studies to install the infrastructure um, can overlay. Got it. So it, it makes a lot of sense to do these to plan these things up front. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, Mega is, we have tons of great questions from the audience. So thank you audience for those. And Mega is going to start peppering you with some of those, if that's okay. Cool. Um, so one of the questions that came up a bit in the chat, um, and I think it's a bit of an elephant in the room when it comes to geologic uh, sequestration of CO2 is the idea of seismic risk. Um, and I think we touched on this a bit, but could you recap exactly you know, what the risk is, how much we should worry about it, um, how that differs for terrestrial versus offshore, uh, do we need to be worried about, you know, tsunamis on Long Island if we're starting to sequester CO2 under the Empire Wind Concession in 2035? Um, we also got a couple of questions about induced seismicity. Um, so could you just touch on those and sort of what could be done to mitigate any of those risks? So, so there's some experience here. Um, again, I'll, I'll refer to the, 
the, the, the excellent and well-established work in Iceland where they have been injecting for a while in, in basalt in particular and in shallow basalt, right? Relatively shallow. Um, they induced, they in, had injected um, a dissolved form of CO2. Uh, so basically water, which induces pressure and in, the, in the reservoir. And that pressure then has the potential to trigger earthquakes and volcanoes and regions around volcanoes such as Iceland um, tend to have small earthquakes just from their faulting, natural faulting and, earth, and, their, uh, and the movement of, of magma and lava. So um, they did induce some early on induced earthquakes and then were able to manage that pressure to make them go away. Basically, so at the fundamental level, managing the pressure the pressure fronts um, due to injection works, and it has been done in many locations. I Iceland just came to mind because it was um, uh, it's a shallow example. The in this particular case, um, it's much deeper, um, and we don't know exactly about the the flow in those reservoirs, how fast it will be. If it is similar to what we ex what we'd expect on land or in uh, on in some of the sandstones offshore, there are, uh, for those who are familiar with this, hundreds of, of millidarcies of, of permeability, so reasonably uh, reasonable flow. And in some of the basalt layers, the thinner, um, uh, the, not necessarily thin, but the top layers that are called flow tops, um, the permeability, lateral permeability, the ejectability can reach um, darcies, a thousand millidarcies and more. So. That allows for a lot of injection uh, without a lot of back pressure. And you can basically pressurize that injection. And the one thing that we can do very well um, in all of, our, uh, all of our injection technologies is monitor pressure. So pressure monitoring, pressure management is exactly the uh, tools that we would use to, to study and, and mitigate if there even were indications of, of some uh, induced cracking and things like that. Now there's a big this important distinction between the West Coast and the East Coast as well. Um, the West Coast is naturally seismically active. So the solid carbon area, the Cascadia area um, along the fault zones of, of the, the tectonic plates and under the, uh, on the other, the downgoing tectonic plate on, on the uh, inshore side have deep potential large earthquakes. There's a, what's been called the seismic gap um, where there's uh, potential for a large earthquake sometime in the future that will occur. Um, and to, to, so there, there's a distinction in the tectonics of the two areas, um, as well as a difference to other areas around the globe. So it's, it's very area dependent. Um, in that area, on, in the Cascadia region, the, the zone that is identified for storage is in the center of the plate, away from those areas of active uh, seismic activity. And it is much, much shallower. Those, those earthquakes are at 10, 10 to 15 kilometers depth. They're quite deep, maybe even, maybe as shallow as five. But we're looking at the top 300 meters of very open basalt. So inducing a uh, large earthquake, uh, uh, analogous that would trigger a, the, the tsunamogenic one, that's a tectonic origin, seems, seems highly unlikely. That said though, that's exactly the area for research that needs to be demonstrated before you do a large scale injection. So that's the, that's the, that's the high, that's the 10,000 foot view of it. The risk I think personally, and certainly from what studies we've done so far is small because of that, but it would be something that we carefully model. That makes sense. Um, we got a question about the specific conditions uh, on the East Coast of the US. Uh, so the question is, offshore the East Coast of the US, near the coast where wind is deployed, uh, basalt is deeply buried, so in the tens of kilometers. Wouldn't this strongly favor storing CO2 in pore space in favorable sedimentary rocks like sandstones uh, confined by shales in the upper few kilometers? And would we expect permeability to be preserved at deeper crust burial of basalt? I mean, excellent, excellent question. Um, the, the salts aren't, we don't expect the salts to be that deep. Um, the water depth is shallow. And the basalts are probably one to two kilometer depths in these, in these rift basins. So they're, they're uh, if you recall those long, elongated purple um, areas, those are the rift basin areas and they're contained sort of laterally onshore, offshore. So uh, they're, they're buried, they're buried rift basins. So those are, um, uh, above those in, in the, the rest of that basin is very uh, highly sedimented with low porosity sand and shale and, and mudstones. 
uh, as we anticipate. Again, we haven't drilled these yet, so we don't know for sure, but it could very well be that the basalts that are buried have interflow basalts, uh, interflow uh, layers that are, uh, that are still open. Interestingly enough, the onshore versions of these basalts, even though they're some of the oldest, uh, these are 200 million year old basalts, as opposed to young basalts in Iceland or even, or even middle-aged basalts in Washington state. These, these are much older and these have been in laboratory experiments, some of the most reactive. Uh, they've mineralized most quickly. So all that needs a lot more work, but it is potential to, it has potential to be still a very viable uh, mineralizing reservoir. But I don't exclude, and I mentioned this early on, I would not exclude the, the nearby sand reservoirs as, as well. There's lots and lots of Yigastan's potential storage. The differences uh, between basalt and, and sand so storage are basically the advantage of mineralization. If that makes sense. Um, another question we had about, about sort of how people can plug into this. So uh, the person says, great talk, um, and asks, can you talk a bit more about the industrial partners in the basin? Uh, what are the proposed projects and the best insertion points for DAC company or technologies uh, to use both the injection facilities and offshore renewables? So, so there, there's, a, there's connection to all the, to the DAC companies um, on the most, most directly on the West Coast project, the solid carbon project, partly because the uh, uh, one company, Carbon Engineering, is local. Um, it's right located right there. So we've had the most recent conversations with them about the West Coast, but it is um, certainly uh, any, of the, any of those technologies are viable. Um, engaging with those companies, the first, the first uh, ask here is really to the um, industrial wind platforms, right? Uh, to see that the, the idea of, uh, whether this idea of powering that activity uh, through curtailed wind or even direct wind uh, makes sense and is viable and is something worth investigating uh, to, to build out in a, in a joint way. So that would be the, the first step in terms of industrial collaboration in my, in my view. Um, development and continuing advantages and, and in fact, mar uh, uh, marinization of the direct air capture systems, which have not been deployed to my knowledge in the marine environments before um, is something that would need development. So that's another area for, for collaboration with the industrial sector. Um, and then the characterization work, I'm sort of thinking this is actually all in reverse, but the earlier character of it, characterization work um, can certainly be collaborated, can be uh, conducted in collaboration. Um, and there's a lot of that going on these days up and down the East Coast for, for wind farm development. Got it. Um, I know we're getting close to our time, so I'm going to have one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so the question is, does it make sense to inject CO2 into saline aquifers for mineralization? Uh, this is instead of pumping water into it. Um, I guess I'm not, I don't understand the question entirely. I mean, CO2 is being pumped into saline aquifers uh, around the world, some 40 million tons annually, a variety of places, a variety of ways. Um, some of them, well, some of it is for, for EOR. The, the uh, saline aquifer opportunity onshore versus offshore, um, I think there's some real distinctions there. I believe that moving this activity offshore is going to be generally um, safer, more acceptable, and um, a little bit more expensive because obviously doing anything uh, on a platform is a bit more expensive at, at a minimum for the transport of CO2. But even if it's captured CO2 and injected, um, saline aquifers are completely viable as, uh, but I don't know that they would be, they, they may or may not mineralize. And they may or may not, if they do, they may or may not mineralize as, as rapidly as, um, uh, and as, as a basalt or a, a peridotite or other formations that have the, the chemical makeup to do so. Right. Um, okay, with that, I think we'll wrap up the questions. Uh, thanks, Dave, this was super interesting for me. Um, I'm just gonna hand it over to Toby to wrap things up. Thanks very much. Dave, that was really great. Um, thank you so much. And we really appreciate your time today and for being with us. Um, 
we and to the audience, sorry, we couldn't get to all your questions, but please feel free to message us with those and we can try to follow up with any answers. This is CDR continues next week with kind of a companion segment to talk about how we can sequester CO2 and carbon in our built environment. Um, as Dave mentioned, the offshore opportunity in New York is is very promising, but it's going to take some time to develop. And one thing we can do right now, if we capture CO2, is put it into concrete, for example. So that's pretty important, I think, for a lot of the policy ideas we're thinking of in the near term with respect to CDR. In October, we talked about Climeworks. They'll be here on October 5th. We have a very interesting carbon to value company called Mars Materials on um, later in the month. Um, there was a question about Project Vesta in the chat. They're going to be here the last Tuesday of October. And then November, we've got Running Tide, Charm, Planetary Hydrogen, and Noya. So lots of great folks coming up. Links in the chat to the event rights for registration, to the past sessions on YouTube, and to our, our Twitter and sign up form on our website. So uh, please, uh, please join us, and uh, we'd love to stay in touch. Um, but mostly, I want to thank Dave again for such an interesting presentation. Dave is like, Dave's super busy and we're very grateful for him sharing his time and expertise with us today. So thank you, Dave. Be My well, pleasure. everyone have a great climate week and we hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining.